Here McNeil and others and <coughs> Yes, Mr. And also uh, up here for the uh, claimants uh, below the appellants uh, in this court in this matter with Ms. Criddle, um, Mr. Lyndon Houston and Mr. Murdo here for the uh, respondent. Uh, my lords, the appellants, and um, if you'll forgive me, I'll refer to them as the uh, claimants as they were before the tribunal yes, to keep things easy, uh, pursue equal pay claims against the respondent uh, based on comparison with longer serving and higher paid male colleagues in the same grades. Uh, in our skeleton argument at paragraph 5, uh, we note that this is the first case at this level uh, to consider uh, the proper method for testing particular disadvantage under section 69.2 of the uh, Equality Act 2010 in a case where the pay differentials that are complained about uh, fall within a range uh, without set pay points uh, and without a simple division between people who benefit and people who don't. It raises in that respect two interlinked questions of fundamental importance to this area of the law. The first is what is it that has to be measured when you're determining particular disadvantage? And the second, specific to this type of case, is what that means for the correct methodology in a case like this. Our strong central contention, it's the central argument in what we call our overriding ground of appeal, is that where you are using statistics to test particular disadvantage, and of course you don't have to, but where you are, what you have to measure is the disparate impact, not the size or value of the individual or cumulative or average differences that are the subject of the claim. And that as a matter of inescapable mathematical logic in a case of this kind, using total average basic pay as the respondents contend and as the tribunal and the EAT held, measures the wrong thing and a differential distribution analysis measures the right thing. Mr. Cooper, I put you on notice of the marker that in some circumstances, on some facts, you might need both. Uh, well, we can perhaps explore that when we, when we get there, and um, I, that may be right. Um, but uh, certainly on these facts and in these circumstances, it's our contention that, that the former is logically wrong and the latter logically right. I, I understand the point, but when convenient, I'd like to develop a thought. Of course. Well, well, another, another when convenient. I would like to know how your approach works out at the next stage. Uh, firstly, how it translates into an individual claim, yeah. uh, and secondly, uh, what would have to be considered at the level of just in the context of justification. Obviously, justification as such is not before us, but I would like to know what kind of exercise justification would be, and what would be the factors that would have to be taken into account, because although it often happens in these <coughs> cases where one point is taken as a preliminary point, one has to look at the bundle of provisions as a whole and see how the interpretation of one end of the exercise works out with the other. Yes. Um, well, my Lord, if perhaps I could give you a road map and uh, yeah. um, indicate where those points might conveniently fall within that road map. Um, uh, j just before I do, I, would, I was going to remark that the, the central contention I've, I've given to you is, is one of those points that is easy to state in 20 or 30 seconds, and then we, we'll no doubt spend a day and a half arguing about <coughs> it. Let's see if we can only spend a day. But <laughs> Let's yeah. see if we can only spend a day. We'll, we'll do our best. And yes, well, no, no, don't feel under pressure, but let's see. Um, and, I, and I realise on reading our skeleton argument that actually all of the points in the end keep coming back yes. to that central contention and it, it seems 
sort of fairly repetitious when, when you go back and read it. So first of all, apologies for that. Um, but secondly, I think that means it, it's best not to try and subdivide this appeal into separate points or uh, grounds of appeal. It's best, as the respondents indeed do, to treat it as, as a whole. Um, but also, because all this, the issues are so intertwined, it's easy to start off down one issue or one track and then get sidetracked onto another. So what, what I'm going to try and do to keep a grip on my argument, but of course if your lordships wish to take me uh, to other points, I'm uh, happy always to go there, um, is to take the background fairly briefly, but then I'll come back to points of detail as they're relevant to particular strands of the argument. And then I'll develop what is essentially our positive case first, starting with uh, looking in some detail at the statutory provisions. And it may be that in the course of looking at those, that's a convenient point to address my Lord Lord Justice Underhill's points about how uh, the argument we're having here fits in with later stages of the, the argument, of the, the analysis in a claim. Um, uh, then I'll develop the question of what it is that has to be measured as a matter of, matter of principle uh, by reference to both EU law and the history of uh, the statutory provisions and domestic uh, authority. Uh, then I will uh, look at how it is that in principle one has to select what it is that, that you do to measure the, the thing that has to be measured. And that's a, a garbled way of saying it, I'd be rather hard to put it way of saying it, um, I, I'm going to be saying you have to focus on logic, and it's, it's a small point, it won't take long, but uh, uh, Grundy makes clear that uh, there are cons the constraints of logic apply to any analysis. And then I will look at, um, at the logic of the two competing approaches in this case, and it would seem convenient when looking at that issue to address my Lord's point about uh, whether it's always the case that you have to choose one or the other or whether you may look at the two together. Um, <coughs> and then after that I'll pick up on any miscellaneous points that arise from the reasoning of the, of the two tribunals below or respondents argument. So starting then with the background, um, as I say relatively briefly, um, the claimants are all employed in grades 7 and 6, 6 being the higher grade, confusingly. Um, the respondent operates pay ranges for both grades that have a defined minimum and a defined maximum. It may just be worth turning those up in the supplemental bundle right at the start so we can see what, what it is that we're, we're arguing about in terms of the, the framework of the pay structure. Pages 314 and 315... for each of those two grades, different ranges for London and then nationally outside London, through from 2006 up to 2009. <coughs> Sorry, which, which, which is six and which is seven? Oh, I see, three, one. Sorry, I'm being slow. They, the, I, we got the four, four columns, uh, yep. uh, not columns, rows, London National and London National, um, but in fact, the first row goes London, it goes 2006 to 2009, then presumably the third row picks up from that. Yes, it does. To, sorry, 2010 through to 2013. So wait a moment, so those two go together and those two go together. So is, and this is for, oh, I see. Now I'm with you. Down the left and then hand six side, and seven. various grades. We're only concerned with the last two of those, grade yeah, six and grade seven. So in seven, there is a <coughs> range of about ten thousand pounds, and we get two thousand five. Yeah. And six, there's a range of about thirteen thousand pounds. Quite big ranges. Quite big ranges, and you can see if you read along, yes, you I have the there are there's range lengths. Range lengths, and it's it's about. 
looking at 2005, 24% range length for both of them in terms of the, the potential value of the total. And also, for each year, you see the percentage increases that are being applied to the minimum and maximum as part of the pay settlement for each year. And just so that I can put it into the context of other um, civil service, some other civil service grade systems, uh, does six come below senior civil service? Yes, six is, as I understand it, the last level that's last below level. senior civil service. Okay. Lots of nodding on the, the other side. And then over the page, just to complete the picture for the period that we were concerned with in the tribunal, you've then got the same for 2015. Yes. And what period are we concerned with for these claims? Up to 2015. Start, uh, starting when? Uh, starting six years earlier, so 2009. So in fact, 2006, five, not really, I mean, it's hit there because how the figures are presented. But the first box that's relevant for our purposes is? Is 2009. Now the range is actually already quite a lot. The ranges have shortened in the three years before that. They have. Down from 24% to 20% or thereabouts. Have they gone on shortening? They have. If you look through to 2013-14, you'll see that by 2014 they go down to about 16, just under 16%. And over the page, by 2015, to just under 15%. Is that a matter of deliberate policy, or is that a result of...? Deliberate policy. <coughs> yeah, thank you. So, well, well, the reason sure. I... May I just, while I've interrupted you, just ask a factual question. Um, we have, whatever it is, 44 claimants. Uh, there is somewhere, I suspect, I'm not sure I found it, a list of which of them are in six and which of them are in seven. There probably is. I'm not sure. No, off the top of my head, but I'm sure we can find Might it. Just someone could give me the figures. Um, there are a very large number of comparators for six and for seven. I can't remember the number, I found the list you know, over a dozen in each. Um, are all the comparators at the top of the range? Not all of them are right at the top, they think, in the collection. So what is the point of the ones who aren't? What's the point of having more than one comparator? Um, well, looking ahead to the potential justification stage, one possible outcome in a case of this kind following Wilson and Cadman is that there may, it may be justified to rely on link, length of service for a certain period, that period roughly equating with the time it takes for someone to reach their peak performance in the job, but thereafter no longer justified. So it may be helpful for those purposes to have comparators who aren't right at the top because that the differences in those cases may not be justified or may not just be justified to the same extent. That, surely the question then wouldn't be whether they're right at the top, but the question would be how long they've been, um, how, uh, how long they've been in employment, but how long they've been in grade. Yes. To some extent an accident when they're at the top of principle, the longer they've been there, the more likely they were to be at the top, but it might not work out that way it? because of the because there are no fixed points. That, that's true. Um, but anyway, the reason there are so many comparators is, is to cover the possibility that a degree of differential due to LOS may be justified. Yes. And they've been chosen with that in mind, have they? Yes. Not all. It's unlikely, though. Oh, I see, yes. They were, they were at or near the top when chosen. They might not have been in six years previously. 
but you're still comparing with yourself with them for your claim city as that. Yes. <coughs> Sorry, I've got into one of the questions I'll ask you later, but. difficult to see how this exercise is going to be done, isn't it? I mean, in principle, and subject to the possibility of being able to justify part of the differential, in principle, all your claimants are claiming uh, the top of the range. Yes. So, like, since we begin to touch on it, just looking ahead to that yes. point, it, um, it, as with all of these indirect equal pay cases, indirect discrimination equal pay cases, there is the potential for huge complexity. But at its simplest, if, if we, let's say, win outright and it's found that reliance on length of service in this way is not justified at all, then everybody gets the top of the pay scale. And that's, that's a simple answer. But equally simple, really, is the proposition that the tribunal finds uh, it is justified to rely on length of service to differentiate between individuals for up to three years of uh, service in the grade, then it's actually not a terribly difficult exercise to go back and reconstruct where a claimant ought to have been after three years in the grade, compared with a comparator of, uh, at, at, at that point. And is that approach, that, which you call the Wilson and Cadman approach, um, in Wilson and Cadman, that was an old-fashioned yearly increment where everyone went up every year, yes. up just to the next step, possibly, but this was really a footnote in the case of exceptionally poor performance, but otherwise you went up automatically simply by being there. Yes. And I can see that that's fairly straightforward, but is it, would it be open to a tribunal to say three years okay or five years okay, anything more not okay, in circumstances where you don't have annual increments of that kind? It would be open to a tribunal to say that, yes. yes, because what they're looking at ultimately is whether it's justified to differentiate between people based on length of service and to what extent that's justified. So the, the principal um, criterion by which that will be assessed at justification stage is, is over what period, if any, does an individual continue to... Uh, get better with experience uh, in grade. Haven't I think got Wilson Cameron in the bundle? You've been very austere, right to say what you put in. But that was just, in case my lords aren't done, that, that was in the health and safety executive. Yes. To another public sector. Uh, and the eventual outcome was that the tribunal said up to how many years? You probably can't remember, but, it, off my head. but it was up to. It was about Five, I think. Yes, I think that's right. And that was upheld in the Court of Appeal. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, my lords, the reason I started by going to the pay scales uh, in that way is to emphasise up front that these are not an artificial construct that the claimants have come up with in this case. And let me also make clear that I don't suggest that the fact they're defined in this way makes them a separate contractual term from. Uh, basic pay, they obviously are part of the basic pay term, nor for my purposes do I need to get into an argument about whether they are themselves incorporated strictly as part of the contractual term as the basic pay. What they are is part of the formal pay practice, pay framework that the respondent applies, whether it's contractual or not. My suspicion will be, uh, as you know, it's, it's irrelevant whether it's contractual or not. What matters is that it's a real thing. And most importantly, for these purposes, it is simply logically right that 
the factor of length of service can only affect the amount of pay that someone gets between the minimum and the maximum. So when we come on to look at the statute, and I'll be saying to you, at the stage we're concerned with, section 69, subsection 2, one is concerned with analysing the causal effect of the factor. And as a matter of logic, the factor of length of service can have no causal effect on all of the pay up to the minimum. It can only have a causal effect on the amount of pay that somebody gets above the minimum. <coughs> the way that it does so in this particular case, and we've touched on this already, is that the uh, position of an individual employee between the minimum and the maximum, and therefore their basic salary, is determined primarily by how long they've been in the grade and therefore how many opportunities they've had to move through it with the annual increments that are awarded. And you'll have seen that this is not a case where there are fixed spiral points. The uh, amount of an annual increment will depend on the particular pay award in each particular case. But the effect of that operation is that in any particular year, it's the fact I've been here longer than you that means I'm getting more than you. This is in the agreed statement of facts, but just so that I can understand it. So what happens in, take a year at random, 2013, is that HMRC says, well, following a process of negotiation, but the increase will be, is it, uh, would it be is it in percentage terms or? It's in percentage terms, usually. Uh, it will be, say, to... 2% for people with uh, this level of performance, 1.5% uh, for that level of performance, and 0% for the, the people who are above the perform. Yes. That, that's how we conceptualise it. That's how we conceptualise it, and they, on occasion there, is also, there are also def differentials based on how far up the scale you are as part of the respondent's deliberate policy of trying to move everything up and shorten the pay scales. So if you're lower down, you might go up faster by 3%. If you're nearer the top, you might go up less by 2%. So there are those variations that may apply within it. But, but, but is it performance-related? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, but in practice, that produces relatively little difference because in, I, I think, all of the years we're concerned with... Um, Top performers and good performers, acceptable performers, all moved up by the same amount, but th it was only if you performed to an unacceptable level that you got a lower increase, and the proportions that did that were very small, and I think I'm right in saying don't affect any of our claimants or comparators. So the, the, the three factors that it was agreed do affect where you end up above the minimum, are length of service, performance in that manner I've described, and particular rules that may put you above the minimum when you move into the grade, depending on where you're promoted from and the level of pay that you have in your previous grade. Yes, the first of those, length of service, in fact incorporates, <coughs> but this I think doesn't affect your point, <coughs> all sorts of micro points, yes. like what award is made in a particular year, and as you explain, that's not a straightforward percentage, because it's quite part of the performance. Um, those near the bottom of the scale will get a bigger award than those near the top. Yes. Is that binary? Is that just a cut-off point? Everyone over 60,000 gets 3%, or uh, gets 1% 1, 1 and everyone below gets... Yeah, I think, or or is, it, is there some sort of sliding scale? I think from recollection it, it, it literally is those at the maximum get a smaller percentage and those below the maximum get a bigger one. might be useful if someone can do this over lunch just to give us 
presume it exists somewhere, a typical award in for a typical year so we can see what it looks like. Yes. I appreciate it won't affect the questions we have to decide, but one wants to understand it. Yeah, I'm sure we can find an example of, of one. You. And it, it may be useful just while we're touching on the, the three different factors that affect, affect um, pay. First of all, to emphasise, of course, we only complain about the effect of length of service. We don't complain about the effects of performance and um, starting salary and grade. And maybe you sort of see that the reason for that, uh, if you go in the core bundle to page 160A14, apologies for the multiple uh, page numbers, you have there is <coughs> an analysis of the mean pay by length of service. So for people with zero years service, one, two, three, up to ten or more years service in grade. And th the reason I take you to that is to show that if you simply compare the people with the e equivalent service, that is removing length of ser the, the effect of length of service and any differences will therefore only be attributable to differential performance or differential starting salary. A any pattern of clustering or indeed small average differences disappears. So that shows you that both why and as a matter of fact that it's correct that we're only looking at length of service because if you remove the effect of length of service, you remove any differential, uh, whichever analysis you're going to be looking at, the, the pay is essentially the same. All any differences are fairly random and go one way, one, one way one year and one way the next. So may I ask just one other factual question? I saw in one of the experts' reports that. Uh, there were, I think he or she said, simply for one, <coughs> one grade, or maybe referring to two, more than 100 different pay points in a year. Yes. Which strikes me as astonishing. For it's, uh, it's because the way, of the way it's done. It's not a, an easy step up from 1 to 7 or 1 to 10 or 1 to 15. Well, I suppose if people have been there a long time, you know, some will have benefited from... 2% last year, and other, but then there, I can see how it could happen. Yeah. Is there a table which actually shows what those pay points were? There, uh, somewhere there is a scatter graph that shows you that how they appear around the line. Someone could give me the reference. Again, it's only illustrative, but you yeah. can appeal for these things for, to understand <coughs> the conception of the question we're going to be asking. Yes. Maybe, and yeah. That's why you need the only way you can show it is a scatter graph or something. Yeah, something exactly right. And if I, if I can make a sort of rhetorical point at this stage in relation to all of that, of course, we don't control this pay system. What we're trying to do is, is analyse the, the legal issues that arise in relation to a pay system that's being devised and applied by the respondent. And one of the points I'm going to come on to develop, but it may be worth foreshadowing now, is we shouldn't be disadvantaged and it shouldn't change the legal principles underlying the analysis simply because the respondent's chosen a pay system that it's difficult to analyse by way of the more conventional methods. So in the, the simplest case, in a binary uh, example where you either get a thousand pounds extra or you don't, then Conventionally, it's easy to analyse. You can simply look at the proportions in each group. Even with a pay system with set pay points, 
you can then look specifically at the proportions in each group, at each pay point, and compare them. So it's, it's the fact of the respondent system that puts us in this position, and that should not affect the underlying principles that inform the analysis that you have to perform. In fact, when I used to do these cases at the bar, I never came across a case where there weren't fixed, it wasn't fixed progression. It was sometimes a bit fuzzy, which of the performance element, but there were always <coughs> fixed spinal points. Is this a fairly recent, can't be that recent, but of course, it was about a long time ago. Um, and you always, you always see cases historically anyway. Is this, is this quite a common situation now in the public sector or in the, in the, um, in the white I've sector? I've certainly done one other case with a similar sort of system, but I couldn't tell you no. uh, with any authority how common it is within the public sector. Uh, and it's the... Um, well, the, 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 there's a single recognised trade union for these groups, which, is that right, the, which is the FDA? The FDA, yeah. Um, and these are the products of negotiation, though I'm sure the FDA would say negotiation in, where we don't have all the cards. In fact, it's in the, the agreed facts that they are the product of uh, imposition following consultation. So um, yes, agreement is never required. So and the, I collective think agreement, the collective agreement <coughs> is not an industrial type collective agreement where there no. has to be agreement. It's, it's imposition following consultation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The effects that we're concerned with in this case arise because these grades were historically male-dominated and women have been recruited to a greater extent more recently. Uh, and you find findings to that effect in um, the Tribunal's Judgment, paragraph 19, subparagraphs 40 and 47. Um, the effect of... That fact, together with the way that length of service operates here, uh, is that women are clustered disproportionately at the bottom of the pay scales and men dis disproportionately at the top. And at paragraph 20 of its judgment, the tribunal accepted that and said the figures speak for themselves. It may therefore be worth it right at the outset going to those figures um, page 112 in the core bundle, first of all. <coughs> there you have the figures by quartile for page 112, grade 7, London and National, and then over the page, grade 6, London and National. Uh, and rather than me reading out lots of numbers, could I just ask you to, to cast your eyes over it and note that consistently you have a substantially higher proportion of men than women at quartile 1, Sorry, women than men at quartile one, and a substantial, substantially higher proportion of men than women at quartile four. And in between, the picture is not entirely consistent, but um, I'll say something more about that in a moment. So looking at the, the picture in between, if I could take you then to page 118. <coughs> what you have there is an analysis which breaks down the proportions cumulatively at each of the points, quarter, half, three quarters, and so on. Um, and, uh, and what you can see is that if you draw a line at any of those points, wherever you draw that line, 
below the three quarters point, you have a higher proportion of women than men. And then consistently in the top quarter, you have a higher proportion of men than women. All this is common ground. All this is common ground. This, these figures are agreed. And so what I've just taken you through are two tests, in effect, for looking at the distribution uh, of the uh, pay within these grades. The second being a cross-check on the first. So the first seems to show clustering. The second takes the, the potential objection well in between. It's not entirely clear. How can we test that further? Let's look at each of those points and see whether wherever you draw the line, there are a higher proportion of women than men beneath it. So it's a, it's a cross-check in that sense. And then a, another cross-check that you can do, because the objection may be taken, well, you're arbitrarily drawing the lines at a quarter, a half, and three quarters. Uh, that, that may be somehow masking something uh, else going on underneath those figures. So then you draw it at different points. You do a decile analysis, which we have at page 115. And again, you see essentially the same picture as in the quartile analysis. Go to page 116 for grade 6. last point I wanted to emphasise in relation to the background uh, before I move on to look at the statutory provisions uh, is in, in response to uh, an argument that's made against us that um, looking at differential distribution is somehow taking pay out of the equation or purely looking at uh, an, an abstract uh, unrelated to actual pay differences. <coughs> and the, the short answer to that is talking about differential distribution within a pay range is just another way of saying these people have different pay. If you say somebody is lower down the pay range, all you're doing is saying that person has lower pay. So it, it's not an abstraction from pay to talk about differential distribution. Uh, what you're saying when you say that women are more likely to be lower down the pay scale doesn't, of course, and I completely accept, tell you the size or value of that difference in actual pay for any particular individual or indeed on an average basis. But what it does tell you is whether they're more likely to be disadvantaged in relation to their pay by some aspect of the, the pay sy system's operation. And that's one of those points where we just come back to that, that core proposition. It takes us right to the heart of it. The, the, the dispute of principle is whether we are to analyse particular disadvantage by reference to actual pays, or even average pay, the size or value of the difference, or whether we're to analyse it by reference to whether somebody is more likely to be disadvantaged in relation to pay. But never forget that we're not talking about an abstraction for pay, we're talking about something that governs pay. I said last point, I've got a, a further point, which uh, is partly a jury point, but isn't purely a jury point, um, because a point is taken against us that the sorts of analysis that we're, we're relying on are difficult and impractical for an employer who can never know what the answer might be in any particular case and therefore never protect themselves against equal pay claims. Um, and the, the jury point answer to that is that's actually what the respondent did in this case because the claimants pursued an internal grievance, the outcome for which you've got at page 316 of the supplemental line. 
And uh, within that, uh, paragraph 25... So what's the reference? Uh, 316 of the supplemental. You're not part. asking us to look at it at the moment, or are you? Um, I, I think I, I am asking you to look at it, because then I don't need to ever come back to it again, um, and I can make my points by reference back to it. So it's, it's 316 of the supplemental bundle. It's a, a fairly long document, so I'm not going to take you all the way through it. But within that, at page 321, at paragraph 25, just to note that the decision maker in this grievance uh, had no difficulty considering service-related increments as a particular element of pay, regardless of their contractual status or otherwise. And then at paragraph 27, uh, concludes there are massive discrepancies and does so by reference to an analysis of the proportions of men and women within each of the decides. And then there's a, a long analysis that follows discussion of the law and so on at, at, at 327 under the heading conclusions at paragraph 61, she concluded <coughs> 61 that the answer to whether that, that this is a policy that discriminates was yes. And at paragraph 63 notes the reason for that, women finally breaking into higher grades, but the timing is such that they uh, can't progress up. So they Scales. I haven't looked at this document before. You say she, uh, that's because we know who the grievance We do, I can't remember her name on the right. Uh, Sue Evans. If they can't do these sorts of analyses in HMRC, where can they do them? <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. Um, so that is all of the, the background I propose to go into at this point. Can I just raise one other factual point, which I don't understand, and uh, it maybe you're coming to it later, Richard, please don't deal with it now, but while we're looking at all these tables, I haven't got my head around this. The clustering effects look quite pronounced, but the average figures, which you say are not the relevant figures, show what they show, it varies for different grades in London and outside, but let's say maximum 3%. Um, and in fact, I dare say the average of the averages, if that's statistically legitimate, it's rather less than, than that. Quite, a, In other words, a pretty small differential between women and men. In. If the clustering effect is as big as it seems impressionistically, it seems intuitively odd that the average differential should be so small, especially when you've got a range as big as these ranges were. Is there a simple explanation for that? Yes, it, it takes us right back to the heart of it. I will develop it later, but I'll give you the answer give, now. Right. It's because if you take an average... Just give me one second, so I want to note this carefully, even though you're coming back to it. Well, well, I first of all note the question. Because clustering is looking at where people are within the range. So those clustered at the bottom will still be paid £40,000 or whatever it may be, uh, and then up to the maximum. Whereas if you take an average of total basic pay, which is what respondents contend for and the ET and EAT held was the only right approach in this case, take an average of total basic pay, then you are including within that the £40,000 yeah. that is yeah, so the basic minimum for everybody. And so you dilute the mathematical answer. So as you say, it does come right back to the it does. question of the case. Yeah. 
Can I turn then to the statutory provisions which are in tab two of the authorities bundle? structure and then focus on the, the bit that matters. But uh, um, section 64 provides that section 66 to 70 apply where, um, and we're concerned with A, a person A is employed on work that is equal to the work of, of the comparator of the opposite sex B. And um, then at section 65, there are three ways in which you can show that your work is equal to that of a comparator. In this case, it's accepted that all of the claimants were rated as equivalent, so that's 65.1b, uh, in relation to their comparators in their grades. And of course, they don't make cross-grade analysis, so it's, it's all within the grades. Uh, then, moving to section 66, the effect of uh, doing work of equal value or work rated equivalent is that an equality clause, a sex equality clause is implied into their contracts of employment by virtue of subsection 1 and that has the effect that subsection 2a, if a term of A's is less favourable to A than a corresponding term of B's is to B, A's term is modified so as to be not less favourable, uh, and then B, uh, if A does not have a term which corresponds to a term in B's that benefits B, A's terms are modified so as to include such a term. So the two scenarios being dealt with there are uh, comparable terms are less favourable to the claimant, uh, that's A, and B, sh missing term, uh, he's got one and, and she doesn't. <coughs> I ought to know this, but I'm much more familiar with the old Act than the new. Um, is terms a defined term? It's not, um, and it's been construed by the uh, authorities, in particular the House of Lords in Hayward and Camel Laird, um, which is where I was going to go next. All that old, I mean, I've seen obviously there's reference, well, we'll go to it, yes. So all that old law about the old act. Still, still, still applies, applies. Yes. I should have said for completeness, because of the timings of these claims, part of the period of arrears covered is still governed by the Equal Pay Act, but yeah. it, 1970, but it's common ground that nothing turns on that. Yeah. So we're all focusing on the, the 2010 Act. Um, at tab five of the authorities bundle, you've got Hayward and Camel Laird in the House of Lords. Uh, and so you're going to that before you take a second. So yeah. no, yes, I was going to show no, how, not, yeah, how the term by term analysis has developed yeah. in relation no, to very helpful. 66. So um, you'll see from the head note that at letter E, the Industrial Tribunal had rejected the applicant's contention that in considering whether there was, were less favourable terms, um, it was sufficient to compare her basic and overtime rates with those of her comparators and had held that without a comparison of all the terms and conditions, she wasn't entitled to a declaration that uh, she was uh, being paid less, uh, and unlawfully so. Um, so the, the tribunal below had, had done a, an overall package approach, are your overall terms more or less favourable? That, that had been upheld by the Employment Appeal Tribunal uh, and uh, the Court of Appeal, and then the House of Lords reversed those decisions, and the first relevant passage is at page 900 in the speech of Lord Mackay, beginning at letter E, sidelined passage there, where he approaches the, the question 
really is a question of, statutory, of statutory construction. The issue is whether the terms of the Equal Pay Act 1970 as amended, um, a woman who can point to a term of her contract which is less favourable than a term of a similar kind in the man's contract is entitled to have that term made not less favourable, irrespective of whether she is favourably, as favourably treated as the man when the whole of her contract and the whole of his contract are considered, as the appellant submits, or whether, although she shows that that particular term of her contract is less favourably favourable to her than a term of a similar kind in the man's contract, her claim can nevertheless be defeated if it was shown that the terms of her contract considered as a whole are not less favourable to her than the term of the man's contract considered as a whole as the respondents submit. And he <coughs> analyses that question then uh, by reference to... Um, the, the natural meaning of the language over the page, in particular at letter B, um, it appears to me that it would be natural to compare the appellant's basic salary as set out in her contract with the basic salary determined under the men's contract. I think it would be natural to treat the provision relating to basic pay as a term in each of the contracts. Um, he then comments further and just before letter D says accordingly I'm of the opinion that the natural application of the word term to this contract is that it applies for example to the basic pay and that the appropriate comparison is with the hourly rate of basic pay. And then in the speech of Lord Goff Just give me one moment. In the speech of Lord Goff at page 906, in the sideline side line passage beginning at letter C, he identifies uh, this as a question of construction uh, and notes the two different um, types of effect of the equality clause, the, the equalising provision and the, the missing term provision, and says it's easier to consider the missing term provision first because... Uh, it provides a more straightforward vehicle for analysis. Uh, and he says it provides, this is just below letter D, <coughs> it provides that if the woman's contract does not include a term corresponding to a term benefiting the male comparator included in his contract, her contract should be treated as including such a term. Next, what does such a provision mean? If I look at the words used and give them their natural and ordinary meaning, they mean quite simply that one looks at the man's contract and at the woman's contract and if one finds the man's contract in the man's contract a term benefiting him, which is not included in the woman's contract, then that term is treated as included in hers. Uh, I won't read the rest of that paragraph unless I'm asked to. And then in the next paragraph, he says it's obvious that this approach, that is the approach contended for by the employer, uh, sorry, no, this approach, that the approach he's outlined, cannot be reconciled with the approach favoured by the Court of Appeal because it does not require or indeed permit the Court to look at the overall contractual position of each party, or even to look at their overall position as regards one particular matter, for example, pay, uh, in the <coughs> excuse me, in the white sense adopted by the Court of Appeal. <coughs> and then at the very bottom of the page, penultimate line, he says the, the alternative construction, the latter construction, he finds to be impossible to derive from the words of the statute, uh, and over the page, I find myself uh, unable to accept it. First, it would mean that the situation of the absent term must be confined only to these cases. Need a, uh, this is all his reasons. This is all his reasons. For something which isn't in itself contentious. No, uh, I can probably take it um, more succinctly um, by noting that uh, ultimately at the top of page 908, he outlines the correct approach. You look at the two contracts. You ask yourself the common sense question, is there in each contract a term of a similar kind? I a term making comparable provision for the same subject matter. If there is, you compare the two. And if on that comparison the term in the woman's contract proves to be less favourable than the term in the man's contract, then the term in the woman's contract is to be treated as modified so as to make it not less favourable. And that's consistent with all of the various aspects of his reasoning. So... Stop me if I'm taking you ahead of yourself. 
but in the case of <coughs> uh, pay, the term in any given year following a pay round, whether negotiated or imposed, is you will be paid £50,000. Yes. And the man's term is you will be paid £55,000. Yes. That, have I got it right? That's your analysis of the term. That's, that's our analysis of the term in this case. Could I go to one other authority before I um, develop a point a little bit further? And what's it? <coughs> Tab 19, you've got uh, Brownville and others against St Helens and Mosley NHS Trust, yep. 2012. <coughs> and you'll see from the headnote uh, at letter, right at the start of the headnote, that that concerned um, health service employees who were employed on shift work and received enhanced payments when they work nights, weekends, and bank holidays as part of their normal contracted hours. The enhanced payments for those working in jobs occupied predominantly by women included the claimants were at a lower rate than those working in jobs predominantly occupied by men. And at letter E, the employment judge found that each claimant and comparator had a contractual term entitling them to enhanced payments for working unsocial hours within the standard working week, which could be compared but that as it was a provision for, for payment of work during normal working hours, the enhancement formed part of the basic pay, and as such there was no less favourable term. So there there was a, a provision for enhancements for unsocial hours, but they had to work those unsocial hours, so that was just what they got paid for turning up and doing their job. And the judge, on the, for, for that reason, treated it as part of a single term as to basic pay. Uh, at paragraph 13, uh, in the judgment of Lord Justice Maurice Kay, he... Uh, something funny has happened here. I did notice this something happened to my bundle, but I didn't follow it through. The front page, we've got the ICR headnote. Second page, which is, for some reason, badly copied, because it may just be mine. And then the rest, we've got it all over again, the IRLR. Um, now, there was a, a problem with the bundles in that we put in yeah. wrongly the EAT judgment first. So is the IRLR that you've got the Court of Appeal or the EAT? The, uh, the, uh, oh, I see. Uh, quite right. It is the EAT. So in my case, maybe I'm uniquely prejudiced, I've just got the first <coughs> two pages of the uh, Court of Appeal. But maybe everyone else has got... Yeah, well, yes, I, I, have, I have what I should have. You have what you should have. Okay. Yes, so, so do I. Uh, so I, think, I think it arrived yesterday or, or possibly today. Yeah. He knows it backwards, so he doesn't need it. So at paragraph 13 in the judgment of Lord Justice Maurice Kay, he refers to the earlier case of Degnan and Redcar <coughs> Cleveland Borough Council 2005. And at paragraph 13, you'll see uh, in that case, the women received the same basic hourly rate as their male comparators. Males also received additional bonuses, bonuses and attendance allowances, which were not paid to the women. Uh, the appeal, court, the appeal to this court was concerned with the attendance allowance, whereas the tribunal had concluded that it related to a different subject matter from basic hourly rates. The EAT and this court disagreed. In the appeal tribunal, Mr Justice Mitting said, uh, our view is that it does relate to the same subject matter as basic hourly pay and the bonus uh, 
and is an element of a distinct part of the contract and not itself a distinct part. And then in paragraph 14, uh, there's a quotation from the judgment of Lord Justice's, uh, from his own judgment in that case. The Employment Appeal Tribunal did not, uh, to use Lord Goff's words, lump together or engage in overall com an overall comparison of different terms. Rather, it applied its collective mind to the reality of the contractual provisions. Uh, I do not understand Lord Goff to have considered that, for example, basic pay and cash bonuses are always and forever dissimilar provisions. Indeed, it's common ground in the present case that the bonus payments are to be treated as part of basic pay. Uh, over the page, second line, paragraph 12, I made it clear uh, it was concerned with the application of Hayward to the reality of the contractual provisions in the circumstances of the particular case. Those circumstances included the fact that when the men's and women's men's terms had been negotiated, there had been a history of bargaining devices and artefacts that tended to conceal the re reality of the pay elements. And then in his discussion of the facts of Brownville itself, beginning at paragraph 20 on page 75, Lord Justice um, Morris Kay says, I'm entirely satisfied that the judgment of uh, Mrs. Justice Cox in the EAT is correct. This is not a Degnan case. Just one moment, let me see what she said. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, this is not a Degnan case. As I stated in paragraph 15 above, the men's terms in Degnan had features of artificiality and historical anomaly which tended to disguise the reality. The present case does not contain such fe features. One employment, once the employment tribunal had correctly found, paragraph 35, that there were terms in the women's contracts and in the men's contracts that were susceptible to comparison, and that each of the terms was a distinct provision with sufficient content to make it possible to compare them, so that the benefits are conferred by the provision, uh, uh, conferred by the provision can be contrasted. Uh, this analysis is required by Hayward. Uh, it's also consistent with the thrust of European jurisprudence uh, that, re um, end of paragraph 21 before the quotation, requires each member state to ensure that the principle of equal pay is applied and defines pay for this purpose as, uh, and then there's a quotation in set. Um, this was entirely concerned with initial comparability. It didn't preclude the employer from showing justification precisely um, on the basis of uh, Total hours or yes, and that, that's how it would work in a case of that kind. Yes. You can say, that the employer could say, well, I accept that uh, I give these people overtime and I pay these people a higher basic rate. Um, and so the reason for paying these people the, the young social hours enhancements is because that's an appropriate and justifiable element of their pay and I can identify it as such. So, uh, uh, and that's all part of the justification analysis. Yeah, and he makes that point at paragraph 26. Yeah, exactly. So, <coughs> the effect of Hayward and Brown Bill taken together is that when you're looking at the term, term by term comparison for the purposes of section 66, the court has to look very carefully at the contractual terms. And there's no universal rule of law that, for instance, a, uh, a term for un providing for unsocial hours payments is always part of basic pay or is always a separate term. It will depend on looking at the reality of the contractual provisions. If it's a distinct contractual provision with sufficient content that it can be properly compared, then you have to do a, a comparison of that particular term. If, when you look at the reality, for example, because it's all part of a, a ruse by uh, the union to, to say, we'll have this element, but we'll call it something different, and that's presentationally more acceptable, then you look at the reality and you construe the contract in accordance with those ordinary principles. Now, the reason I spent a little bit of time on that is because it's central to the analysis of both the EAT and the tribunal and the case the respondents advanced, that they, uh, 
seek to read across that term-by-term -term analysis into section 69 when we get there. And the point I wanted to make, drawing on what I've just said about the overall effect of Hayward and Brownville, is that in this case, as I accepted in response to my Lord's question a short while ago, there's a basic pay term. So although the mechanism and the pay structure that underlies it has these maximum and minimum and annual pay awards. In each year, the pay term is you're paid 40,000, he's paid 45,000 for basic pay. <coughs> but what you see from these authorities is that it's perfectly conceivable that in another case, there may be a separate term which provides after five years, you will have, you will begin to receive increments, and those increments will be determined by X, Y, and Z. Maybe it's discretionary factors, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's, a, it's set pay points. But it's entirely possible that there's a separate contractual provision dealing with long service awards, in effect. And... Well. There can be a sense of an easy case because of the history of artificiality. But uh, how do you distinguish between two cases where perfectly genuinely in case or two two different characterizations of the same situation? You could say uh, for this year your uh, contractual entitlement is to be paid £50,000. Or you could say, for this year, your contractual entitlement is to be paid uh, a uh, one £40,000 plus uh, the increments which you have earned from your long service of which amount to £10,000. <coughs> Both would be fair descriptions of what is happening. But which would be, wh how would you distinguish in which is the right description for the exercises we have to do here? Well, well my, my submission is going to be for the exercises we have to do here, we're past that stage and it's, it's all irrelevant. But the reason I'm spending some time on it is for exactly the reason my lord identifies, that, that there is a degree of artificiality about, about approaching it in this way. But the answer that you get from Brownville is you look at the provisions which govern service increments and you identify whether, as a matter of ordinary contractual construction, those are separate terms within the contract with sufficient content to make them comparable, or whether they're part of the same term when you look at the reality of the situation. There's no right answer to that. I mean, ordinary contractual construction, you could do it either way. It wouldn't really matter because, of, because at the end of the day, in your ordinary case, you're suing for your money, it hasn't been paid. You just say, I'm contractually entitled to receive on each monthly payday <coughs> one twelfth of 50,000 pounds. How you got there doesn't matter. But for another purpose, you might be very important to say my contractual <coughs> rights consist of a basic pay and a uh, and an increment. Well, it, it, the answer is there. There isn't a definitive rule that I can give you in a sentence. No. What these authorities show is what they show is that there is not a universal rule one way or the other for this type yeah. of okay element of pay. So if I can take a, an example a little bit removed from the present case, but just to illustrate how it might be important at the comparison stage, if you've got an, an Enderby type case where you've got a caretaker and a, a nurse, say, unlike here where they're all part of the same pay structure and actually it at the comparison stage, it literally makes no difference whether you treat it as a separate term or a single term because they all get the same basic minimum and then the comparison is about the bit above the minimum. 
in, in that sort of Enderby type case, you might have different rates of so base. when you say an Enderby type case, what do you mean? Uh, I'm meaning uh, uh, a division between different job groups doing different jobs, yes. so an equal yeah. value case, yeah. caretaker and uh, a nurse, for instance. You might have the nurse on higher basic pay, but with... No, ent uh, no entitlement to service-related increments or, uh, or a different entitlement to service-related increments from the, the, the caretaker who is on lower basic pay but gets greater service-related increments. And so there really would be an issue uh, on the Brown Bill Haywood analysis for the purposes of Section 66 as to whether you compare those elements separately because they are distinct terms with sufficient content to compare them separately, or whether you compare those as part of an overall uh, package of basic pay. Yeah. So, so there's no law on that? There's no law on that in specific point, but the principles that you get from Hayward and Brown Bill show you that, that it will depend on looking very closely at the, the terms of the contract uh, and whether they are identifiable as distinct terms with... I won't, I, mean, I won't stir you up on it, but that doesn't really tell you how you tell the difference between the two kinds. They look very closely, but what are you looking for? Well, you're looking for... The, the, the reality, but how do you... They're both real. They're just different ways of looking at the reality. Yes. The, the closest you get to it is, are these identifiably distinct provisions within the terms of the contract, and do they have sufficient content to enable them to be compared? That's the closest you get from... But we've probably got a long way from <coughs> this here. Right? Yeah, it, the, 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 the real point I take from that is simply that there isn't a clear answer. So I don't need to tell you how, how you work out what the answer is, but it, it follows from the authorities that in some cases, service increments may be treated as part of basic pay, as we accept is the case here, but in other cases they may not. And the relevance of that for the analysis we're coming on to is that if the claimants and the EAT and the ET are all right, then that analysis does then become relevant. The, the, the inability to draw the brown bill line becomes relevant at section 69 because it depends, it, it, it governs then what you're comparing. They say you have to compare the whole term, but as part of that, you have to identify what the whole term that's being compared is. So I then moved to section 69 back in tab 2. The sex equality clause in A's terms has no effect in relation to a difference between A's terms and B's terms if the responsible person shows that the difference is because of a material factor, reliance on which A does not involve treating A less favourably because of A's sex than the responsible person treats B, and B, the factor is within subsection 2, is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. Subsection 2, in fact, within, is within this subsection if A shows that as a result of the factor uh, A and persons of the same sex doing work equal to A's are put at a particular disadvantage when compared with persons of the opposite sex doing work equal to A's. So to break down the uh, anatomy of that provision and the, the structure of the analysis, you start at subsection 1A, uh, when you start at subsection 1, with the difference between A's terms and B's terms, which you've established for the purposes of section 66. <clears throat> and what is then fundamentally called for under these provisions is a consideration of the difference, of what that difference is caused by. You're, an, you're analyzing what is causal effect of the, the factor in question. 
And as a preliminary observation, because Section 66 covers both missing terms and less favourable terms, the difference that you are looking at uh, and examining for what caused it may, in mo most cases, won't be the whole term. It will be a difference in part of the term. Sorry, say that again. Explain it. S Section 66, we saw, has two scenarios. Less favourable term uh, or missing term. Here we start with the difference, and if the difference is not missing term, but is less favourable term, and then the question is, what has caused that difference? You are not necessarily looking at the whole term. You are looking at what has caused the bit that differs. Yeah, what has caused the differential. What has caused the differential. Yeah. So on subsection one, under subsection one, the starting point is what is the, the cause of the difference? And we call that cause a material factor. Subsection A, 1A, then deals with direct discrimination. So if uh, the employer fails to show that that is not directly discriminatory in the sense of treating A less favourably because of her sex than B, uh, then it will be automatically unlawful because it's directly discriminatory. We're not concerned with that, so we move to indirect discrimination, which is governed by subsections 1B and 2. And those essentially replicate in structure the equivalent uh, provisions of uh, section 19, which we don't have in the bundle, but we can provide it would be helpful. The, the only difference is that we're call, calling the, the causal thing a factor here, and we call it a PCP, provision criterion or practice in ordinary discrimination, indirect discrimination cases. But that's a difference without a distinction. This is all a consequence of the puzzling decision made at the time, the 2010 Act. not to fold pay in directly with every other kind of discrimination, yeah. which is how it's treated in European, European law, yeah. and for the purpose of it all except gender discrimination, yes. and create a little empire for itself, which ultimately, I'm sure, was intended to come to the same thing, but because you set it up separately, it creates all sorts of complications. It does. Um, sorry, that's... Well, I, I think probably you'll get a degree of sympathy from uh, from the bench on, on that. But you're saying I, that, that really we should approach pay, although it has these incredibly elaborate separate provisions, just like we would approach any other form of discrimination in employment. In respect uh, of... Uh, which are governed by other provisions. Yes. To roughly the same effect. Yes. Yeah. In respect of the indirect discrimination uh, provisions and the, the approach to them, yes, absolutely. Um, because of the, the structure of the provisions, you're directed to subsection 2 first. Uh, so if subsection 1b, if the factor is within subsection 2, uh, so you have to get within subsection 2 first. So, and then subsection 2 uh, is concerned with... Uh, analyzing whether as a result of the factor uh, the claimant and people of the same sex are put at a particular disadvantage when compared with uh, the comparator and people of the opposite sex. <coughs> so again it's focused entirely on the causal effect of the factor and is looking at the group effects of that. The particular disadvantage is not the same as the difference between A's terms and B's terms. 
the particular disadvantage is focused on the causal effects of the factor and whether they mean that it is usually women in particular who are more often at a disadvantage or disproportionately at a disadvantage. Does the word particular add anything? It would mean exactly the same if it wasn't there, wouldn't it? It would. Because it is, it is, as you say, normally women, A, and persons of the same sex, will be put at a disadvantage. Yes. It, it may when be. Compared, it, you might, if you didn't have the phrase when compared with, then you might need particular to point out that it's something because of them as women. But yeah. that isn't, yeah, although you are. No. It, it may be that it's intended simply to <coughs> emphasize that anything de minimis wouldn't count. But oh, do you think? Oh, maybe. I don't know. It, it, I it, suspect if we did the archaeology, it comes out of some European judgment. It, it does. Right. So th the central point is that purely as a matter of the, the terms and structure of the statute, you, you leave behind the difference between A's terms and B's at the start of this, the analysis under section 69.1. That's established under section 66 and is the, the starting point for the analysis under six, section 69. But what it, the analysis then moves to is what is the cause of that difference, subsection 1, and does that cause put women at a disadvantage compared with men, subsection 2, in relation to which, as is uh, in my submission clear from the statutory language, but is in any event clear when we come to the authorities, European and domestic, what that means is not does it put women at a disadvantage in relation to the difference between A's terms and B's. What it, what it means is, does it put them more often, more frequently, more likely at a disadvantage in that respect? So what, what it calls for is an analysis, firstly, of the cause of the differential between the terms, and secondly, whether that is more commonly, whether that more commonly affects women than men, or disproportionately affects women to a greater extent than men. Oh, well, your key words are the ones you've already given, more often, more likely, more frequently, more commonly, disproportionately. Another way to slip back into ambiguity, don't you? It's another way of saying the same thing, really. But yes, I'm happy to go with more commonly, more likely. But I thought you were emphasising those words very deliberately. Yeah. 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 Um, because you, you're leaving out of this the extent of the disadvantage. Isn't that the point you're... Um, I'm leaving out of this the, the value or extent of the difference between their terms. Yes, which is why I'm emphasising more commonly, more likely. It's the, it's the incidence of the disadvantage rather than its, its size or value that's yeah. being measured. So it's wise to avoid disproportionate <coughs> Yeah, it probably is. There are two strands which... Uh, support what I've just said to you. Um, I'll, I'll take them the other way around from the, the way we dealt with them in our skeleton argument, if I may. So, first of all, the legislative history and the established methodologies under some of the previous provisions. Um, can I start... Sorry, the, the two strands are the legislative history... That's, the second strand is EU law. Oh, I see. So, the first one is legislative history and you said something else. And established, uh, established methodology. methodology. Okay under those, those earlier provisions. 
So the, the original definition of indirect sex discrimination in the 1975 Act provided that a woman uh, pursuing an equal pay claim was required to establish that a considerably smaller proportion of women could comply with the relevant requirement or condition with a relevant requirement or condition. Uh, and the original definition in EU law in uh, a directive from 1980 uh, provided that um, it was established where an apparently neutral provision criteria in practice disadvantaged a substantially higher proportion of the members of one sex. So what has happened, and I can take your lordships in a moment. Give, give, give me again the key phrase in the 75 Act. Uh, key phrase in the 75 Act was considerably smaller proportion of women able to comply. Yep. And the key phrase in the original directive was substantially higher proportion. So it's, it's the same yeah, just the, the other way around. Yeah. Um, I, we can go <coughs> in, in um, Baroness Hale's judgment in Esop and Naeem, she sets out some of the, the history, and, and I'll go to that in a minute. But I wanted to go first to her judgment in Homer, which is at tab 20 of your Lordship's authorities bundles. <coughs> This, uh, you'll see from the head note, was not a sex discrimination case, but concerned a retired police officer who uh, was employed as a legal advisor. And at the time he was appointed, no law degree was required for that post. But subsequently, a requirement for such a degree was introduced in order to get to uh, the highest pay grade. And that happened at a point where it was too late. He didn't have enough time to to get a law degree and benefit from getting into the higher grade. And um, at paragraph 18, page 1351. Uh, hang on. Uh, sorry, no, I've gone to the wrong paragraph. Five para eighteen, but it's not one three five one. I'm sorry, my uh, electronic wizardry has let me down. Uh, paragraph forty. Um, really? Baroness Hell is, is dealing with an argument um, to the effect that the <coughs> Uh, the provision didn't put uh, that claim to big disadvantage. The, the details argument, uh, the argument uh, which was quite convoluted don't uh, concern us here. But in the third line of paragraph 14, Baroness Hale says, previous formulations relied upon uh, disparate impact so that if there was a significant disparity in the proportion of men affected by a requirement who could comply with it and the proportion of women who could do so, then that constituted indirect discrimination. As Mr. Allen points out on behalf of Mr. Homer, the new formulation was, intended to, was not intended to make it more difficult to establish indirect discrimination, quite the reverse. It was intended to do away with the need for statistical comparisons where no statistics might exist. It was intended to do away with the complexities involved in identifying those who could comply and those who could not and how great the disparity had to be. Now all that is needed is a particular disadvantage when compared with other people who do not share the characteristic in question. It was not intended to lead us to ignore the fact that certain protected characteristics are more likely to be associated with particular disadvantages. So I emphasise three points arising from that. First of all, uh, it, the changes were not intended to make it harder or to do away with uh, cases that could succeed under the previous provisions. Secondly, uh, they were intended to do away with, as far as possible, complexities in relation to establishing who can comply and how great the disparity has to be. And thirdly, the, the essential touchstone, which I take from the last sentence, 
is whether or not the protected characteristic in question is more likely to be associated with the particular disadvantage that you're considering. And then... Hang on one second. And then uh, in ESOP at tab 23, the fi final tab of the authorities bundles, uh, Baroness Hale elaborated on, on similar points. Um, the, the two cases heard together by the Supreme Court in that case uh, are, are summarised in the head notes. You'll see the first case concerned uh, black and ethnic minority civil servants over the age of 35 seeking promotion to the seeking promotion uh, who as a matter of fact uh, were less likely to pass the core skills assessment necessary for promotion and the second case concerned an imam uh, who brought a claim uh, he was appointed as a Muslim chapel in the prison service uh, and Muslim chaplains had uh, only been uh, thought necessary and appointed more recently, so uh, had disproportionately shorter service than Christian chaplains. Uh, at paragraph 18, this, this was the paragraph 18 I accidentally went to a short while ago, um, Baroness Hale sets out the original version of definition of indirect sex discrimination in the 1975 Act, paragraph 18, so there you see just by letter E, considerably small proportion, um, considerably smaller than the proportion of men who can comply with it, and at <coughs> uh, letter H, the original EU definition, PCP disadvantages a substantially higher proportion of members of one sex than the other. And then you'll see over the page at paragraph 21 the first legislative appearance of the, the particular disadvantage phrase is, was in Council to Directive 2043 EC. PCP would put persons uh, of a racial ethnic origin at a particular disadvantage, and that then subsequently finds its way into all of the the domestic and European provisions. And then at paragraph 23, Baroness Hale says it's instructed to go through the various iterations of the indirect discrimination concept because it's inconceivable that the later versions were seeking to cut, cut it down or restrict it in ways that the early ones did not. The whole trend of equality legislation since it began in the 1970s has been to reinforce the protection given to the principle of equal treatment. All the iterations share certain salient features relevant to the issues before us. First salient feature is that none of the various definitions uh, of indirect discrimination is there any express requirement for an explanation of the reasons why PCP puts one group at a disadvantage when compared with the others. Uh, she discusses that further and says, just by letter D, it's enough that it does. Then at paragraph 25, the second salient feature is the contrast between the definitions of direct and indirect discrimination. Direct discrimination expressly requires a causal link between the less favourable treatment and the protected characteristic. Indirect discrimination does not. Instead, it requires a causal link between the PCP and the particular disadvantage suffered by the group and the individual. The reason for this is that the prohibition of direct discrimination aims it to achieve equality of treatment Indirect discrimination assumes equality of treatment, PCP is the, the applied indiscriminately to all, but aims to achieve a level playing field where people sharing a particular protected characteristic are not su subjected to requirements which men and women cannot meet, but which cannot be shown to be justified. The prohibition of indirect discrimination aim, thus aims to achieve equality of results in the absence of justification, it's dealing with hidden barriers. So, um, two points to emphasise from those passages, uh, again, a, a reiteration of the proposition that it's inconceivable that the particular disadvantage formulation 
could reduce or, uh, uh, or contract the protection afforded under the previous provisions. And secondly, the emphasis in paragraph 25 that what one is concerned with is the causal uh, link between the PCP and the particular disadvantage, disadvantage suffered by the group and the individual. So one is focusing on the, the cause, uh, not on the size. And then at paragraph 28 over the page. Hang on. <coughs> the, the, the last distinction you made about emphasizing the cause and not the size, that's not some point that Lady Hale is making. Please. Um, surely making a point that which was the real issue certainly in um, Naim that the cause of the differential impact being demonstrably it really was demonstrably nothing to do with religion isn't a sufficient answer so, I mean, you're right up to a point. Let's see why paragraph 25 helps you, but you can't say she was actually addressing no, the present that's she, wasn't, she wasn't addressing the distinction that I draw between cause and, and size or value, but she was emphasising that what you're focusing on is the cause and effect of the, the PCP, to use the, the normal indirect discrimina discrimination language, or the factor to use the equal pay, and, uh, pay language. Uh, over the page uh, at... Paragraph 27, the fourth salient feature is there is no requirement that the PCP in question put every member of the group sharing a particular protected characteristic at disadvantage. So it's nothing to the point that you can say, oh, well, there are some women near the top of the pay scale. Uh, and um, again, making the point the latter definitions cannot have restricted the original definitions, which referred to the proportion who could or could not meet the requirement Obviously, some women are taller and stronger than, than some men and can meet a height or strength requirement that may, many women could not. Some women can work full-time without difficulty, whereas others cannot. Yet, these are paradigm examples of a PCP which may be indirectly discriminatory. And then at paragraph 28, the fifth salient feature is that it is commonplace for disparate impact, particular disadvantage, to be established on the basis of statistical evidence. That was obvious from the way the concept was expressed in the 1975 and 76 acts uh, and then she considers why that was the case and then at, just below letter E it cannot have been contemplated that a particular disadvantage might not be capable of being proved by statistical evidence. Statistical evidence is designed to show correlations between particular variables and particular outcomes and to assess the significance of those correlations but a correlation is not the same as a causal link. So two points to draw from those two paragraphs. Um, first of all, again, uh, insofar as an analysis of the respective proportions who can or can't uh, benefit was the right approach under the old provisions, um, the later definitions cannot have restricted that approach. And secondly, at paragraph 28, uh, Baroness Hale is focusing there on the distinction between... Sorry, the late, the, on the first one. Later, the later iterations can't have done what? Can't have restricted the, the original ones. So insofar as you could rely on okay. uh, disparate impact as defined in the previous iterations, the, the later ones can't have yep. okay. changed that. What was the second point? Okay. Second point in relation to paragraph 28. Baroness Hale is there focusing on the the distinction between correlation and causal link and saying you don't have to prove causal link to sex, it's the correlation that is sufficient. But what I take from that for our purposes is that again the focus is not on, she's not saying this, but the focus is not on the size of the difference, the focus is on the, the extent to which the incidence of that dif uh, difference really correlates. The same two points you made before, the previous passage. As I say, I'm, this case all, all comes back to the same point in the end. Um, and then lastly, at paragraph 29, just to emphasise that, uh, of course, getting over the hurdle at this stage isn't the end of the story. It's always open to the respondent to justify the, uh, the difference, and there should be no reluctance to reach that point. <laughs>
fourth line down there, so that says sum of up to the root. That might bring you back to correlation and causal link in paragraph 28, and when we get to the very last point that I flagged up at the beginning. Um, because speaking entirely for myself, and having regard um, to Baroness Hale's background, there is a specific scientific purpose to the words she used, which she may or may not have intended. Well, I hope I can assist you with the specific scientific it's, um, the, it's, the method, it's the methodology of statistical analysis which yeah. she um, may well have been referring to the words I've very carefully chosen uh, I, I can't say it's a matter for both of you to consider uh, whether there's meant to be a term of art within those words or whether they're just plain, plain language uh, and she intended to use it uh, well my lord um Speaking for myself, uh, without a, a, a particular scientific or statistical background, and the, the point I draw from it is the, the one I've been yes. banging on about, that, and that it's the important one for our purposes, that it's, it's about correlation between outcome and gender. It's not about size of outcome. <coughs> My Lord, four authorities to canter through fairly quickly on what was the established method under the old definitions of assessing uh, what was then often called disparate impact, but I take my Lord's point that that's not necessarily a, a helpful phrase for anyone in this case because of the ambiguity. Uh, first of all, Enderby at tab 7. This was a, a case in which uh, therapists, speech therapists, pharmacists, and clinical psychologists uh, had distinct pay structures, uh, with speech therapists, a predominantly female profession, being the lowest paid. And so it, this was the, the cross job group, group comparison. Uh, and it, it was uh, on this case a matter of fact that the speech therapists were predominantly female and the other groups predominantly male. Uh, the respondent relies on this uh, case uh, as an instance of emphasising, <coughs> the, they say, the need for uh, significance in the statistics. Uh, and what I think I need to emphasise in that regard is that <coughs> um, what the ECJ was focusing on was not the statistics because they were uh, agreed and it was simply answering a question put to it on the basis of the facts that were before it. But even insofar as it describes and addresses the statistical points, it's focusing on disparate impact, not on size of the difference. So uh, if I could pick it up at paragraph 7 on page 160. Sorry, 160. 160, paragraph 7, the court identifies the question. The Court of Appeal wishes to know whether the principle of equal pay for men and women requires the employer to prove, by providing objective justification, that a difference in pay between two jobs assumed to be of equal value, uh, of which one is carried out almost exclusively by women and the other predominantly by men, does not constitute sex discrimination. And then over the page, uh, at paragraph... 13, principle, in, uh, in principle, the burden of proving the existence of sex discrimination as to pay lies with the worker who, believing himself to be the victim of such discrimination, brings legal proceedings against his employer for the use of discrimination. 
However, it is clear from the case law of the court that the onus may shift when that is necessary to avoid depriving workers who appear to be victims of discrimination of any effective means of enforcing the principle of equal pay. Accordingly, when a measure distinguishing between employees on the basis of their hours of work has, has in practice an adverse impact on substantially more members of one uh, or other sex, that measure must be regarded as contrary to the objective pursued. Uh, skipping then the authority references similarly. Where an undertaking applies a system of pay which is wholly lacking in transparency, it's for the employer to prove that uh, his practice in the manner of matter of wages is not discriminatory. If a female worker establishes, in relation to a relatively large number of employees, that the average pay for women is less than that of men. And I just pause there to observe <coughs> that I, I think I'm right in saying that this is the only instance it, it, type of circumstance identified in the authorities where average pay as between men and women is identified as part of the relevant test. So although it's said against us in this case that we're trying to do something new, in fact, the, the, the approach developed by the ET and EAT and endorsed by the respondent in this case is, is the novel proposition. Because the the, the important point about that passage, which is a summary of the Danfoss case, is that average pay only becomes relevant where you have a pay system that is wholly lacking in transparency. The reason for that, given what we've been talking about so far, is obvious. It's because the, where you have a, a pay system lacking in transparency, <coughs> it's impossible to identify a material factor that you can then analyse for its causal effect. Yes, I mean, the whole point of identity... ..is that there was. You couldn't fit it into a um, provision criterion or practice. Yes. The problem was that a single employer, simply without explaining why, had two different pay systems for yeah. employees who it was assumed were doing work of equal value. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just spelling out the obvious. but um, Exactly. So the, the, the point in Enderby was whether, whether that novel situation engaged the indirect discrimination provisions at all. But in relation to the reliance on average pay as between men and women, it's, it's only where you start with a pay system that's wholly lacking in transparency, so you simply can't analyse the, the causal factors that have led to the difference in pay, that then you're thrown back on, well, we've, we've then just got to look at uh, average pay. As far as I, uh, I'm aware, I'll be told if I'm wrong, there isn't a single other authority that says you look at average pay as between men and women as the, as the test. And in Enderby itself, <coughs> at paragraph 16, you see the, uh, the conclusion on the central point. If the pay of speech therapists is significantly lower than that of pharmacists, and the former are almost exclusively women, while the latter are predominantly men, there is a prime facie case of sex discrimination. So there, when they're talking about the, the significant difference in pay, it's not a significant difference in average pay between men and women. It's a significant difference in pay between the two job groups. And then... Then what you look at, uh, insofar as this is talking about statistics at all, which it isn't really, then what you look at is the, the likelihood of that affecting more women than men, which in a, an enderby type case is answered by whether uh, one group is, uh, has a predominance of women and one group a predominance of men. Can I go then to tab 9 uh, and Seymour Smith in the, uh, in the European Court of Justice? Just give me one moment. In paragraph 17, where the 
court says it is for the national court to assess, but it may take into account those statistics. Would they cover enough individuals? Well, that's essentially statistical significance, isn't it? Yes. Just extracting from very small samples to prove anything. Um, <coughs> whether they appear fortuitous, well, to the same point, really, yeah. or short-term short phenomena, I yeah, sort of understand that, and whether, in general, they appear to be significant. Now, I don't think that means theirs, what we mean statistically significant in the um, arithmetical sense. It means whether you can draw any conclusions from them in a broader sense. It probably, but what sort of conclusions? Well, it probably does. Um, but I'm... But I think in the I think it probably does mean statistical significance, but not in the, not in a technical sense. Yes, All right, but then but then what does it what does statistical significance mean in a non technical sense? Well, it, it means that um, courts tribunals can look at the material and say, well, this this is just blindingly obvious. Bli well, what is blindingly obvious? That, that well, for, us, for instance, in this case, that there is obvious clustering at the top and bottom, and yes, it, it's fairly clear that that correlates with gender. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, that's probably a red herring. So let's move on. Uh, Seymour Smith at tab nine. This was um, <coughs> a uh, a case concerning whether or not the two year requirement, two year continuous service requirement for the right to claim for unfair dismissal was indirectly discriminatory on the basis that uh, women had, on the statistics, very slightly uh, disproportionately shorter service than men. Uh, and at paragraph 59, <coughs> beginning at paragraph 59, the European Court so this is page 597, uh, page 597 uh, discusses the approach, uh, as the United Kingdom government was right to point out, the best approach to the comparison of statistics is to consider on the one hand the respective proportions of men in the workforce able to satisfy the requirement of two years employment under the disputed rule and of those unable to do so, uh, on, uh, and on the other to compare those proportions as regards women in the workforce not sufficient to consider the number of persons affected since that depends on the number of working people in the member state as a whole as well as the percentages of men and women employed in that state. As the court has stated on several occasions, it must be ascertained whether the statistics indicate that a considerably smaller percentage of women than men is able to satisfy the condition of two years employment required by the disputed rule. Uh, and then <coughs> There is a discussion of the approach emphasising at paragraph 62 that it's for the National Court to assess whether the statistics are valid, can be taken into account, that is to say whether they, um, and it's the same, same yeah. language that we saw in Endeavour. Um, and then there's a discussion of particular statistics in that case and the uh, overall answer to the, third, to, to the question of paragraph 65. So um, what is clear from Seymour Smith, and it's picked up in the last two cases I'm going to go to on this as well, is that under the old rules, what you were analysing was the difference in proportions of women and men in the advantaged and disadvantaged groups. What that doesn't involve at any point is putting into the mix the value of the difference in treatment between them. You, you leave that behind as the starting point. You never get to this stage if you don't have a, a difference in treatment. But then what you analyse is the incidence of that difference in treatment, whether uh, as a woman you're more likely to experience the less favourable treatment. But it didn't really arise as a question, did it? Uh, no, it didn't. It wasn't about pay, no. Um, uh, tab 10, Barrier Midland Bank, is the next case which was about pay. <coughs> uh, to do with a severance payment calculated on length of continuous service. Uh, and 
in her case, in the claimant's case, she'd been employed for much of her service full-time, but that had then gone part-time, and she was complaining that her full-time service was nevertheless treated for purposes of the calculation of her severance payment as part-time service. She lost because uh, it was ultimately held to be justified that the uh, employer adopted that approach. But in the course of uh, the analysis, at page 1474, Lord Nichols uh, identifies the, the right approach again under the old provisions. So in order to decide whether the bank scheme letter has a disparately... Sorry, so far, because we've been um, dealing with key points, I have allowed you just to read chunks out. Yeah. I think probably from now on, we can read them to ourselves. Very happy to do that. I've just saved um, my voice. It, it, really, the sideline passage, is that yeah, right? sideline passage. Able to read that. So as well as uh, emphasising the same points, that it's about disparate adverse effect, or as I've been putting it, whether you're more likely to be affected as a woman, and that the value of the difference in value of the severance payment simply doesn't come into the equation, uh, I also draw from that, perhaps an obvious point anyway, the, the need to be very careful with your mathematical analysis to look for the way in which um, statistical quirks may seem to create a misleading impression. So it's a different misleading impression in the present case, but it's this, the same sort of point that you need to be on the alert for. I have a feeling that that's the answer to the question I've asked. Although he thinks about it only the shorter term, right? um, but, but that I think is the answer to the statistical phenomenon of distribution that we've been working on. Yeah. And, and can, on that, can I perhaps give you a, uh, a partial answer to, to look for? As, as part of the analysis before the employment judge, we took the, the, the relevant proportions in the top uh, group and not. Uh, and uh, I'm just finding the reference in the supplemental bundle uh, at... Page 40, 142, this was in one of the pleadings that was before the, the judge. Supplemental bundle. Supplemental bundle 142. Example, but as perhaps the most telling one, the upper quartile, uh, and drew a line at that point, and said how likely, uh, and did the analysis on the Barry approach of how likely it is that you'd be in the upper quartile as a woman compared with a man, and it, you'll see that the ratios there are all significantly less than the 0.8 or ratio of four to five that is usually taken to be statistically significant as a rule of thumb. So the, what, what those figures are effectively telling you, uh, to take the example of 2009 upper quartile grade 6 London, because it's a nice round number, is that you, you've got a ratio of 3 to 5 there. That means if you are uh, a woman, the chance of you being in that upper quartile is three-fifths that of a man. 
And the last authority uh, on this point is Bailey at tab 14. You didn't do the reverse analysis for the lower, for the lower quartile? Uh, we didn't, no. Bailey, uh, tab 14. This was a case in the prison service where administrative and similar workers who were, uh, to a great extent, women were comparing themselves with prison officers. The, the principal issue here was whether or not, in order to establish disparate impact under the, the then definition for the purposes of an end of type case, so you're comparing two separate job groups, you had to show, as in end of that it, one was almost exclusively women and the other predominantly men, or whether you could do a Seymour Smith and Barry type analysis, and the tribunal had adopted a Seymour Smith Barry type analysis as between those two occupational groups. This um, is where you and Mr. Moretto first from cross swords. Indeed, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, the Court of Appeal upheld uh, the tribunal's approach. Could I ask you to read uh, in particular paragraphs 29 and 30 of the judgment of Lord Justice Peter Gibson? Pausing between G and H and 29, do you endorse what he says is the ultimate question, whether employees are disadvantaged to an extent that signifies that disparity is prima facie attributable to <coughs> the difference of sex? Isn't I, that a, isn't I think that a, that's a direct discrimination. Yeah, analysis. I think that's been to some extent uh, superseded by Esop and Naim. It, uh, the, in some of the language of some of the earlier cases, you do find this, it, it may just be a looseness of language, it may be a, a misconception underlying it, but you sometimes find the use of language, we're looking for a sex taint or we're looking for a difference that's... Well, I think it goes back to a perception, which I must say I shared until mm -hmm. Naeem, that indirect discrimination was all about, the conceptual basis of indirect discrimination was there was some sex causation going on somewhere, yeah. And there was simply a problem that you couldn't find it. Yeah. Uh, and if you could find it, that's why um, you then got out of indirect discrimination. But you could find there wasn't one, I should say, sorry. Um, but that is quite clearly not the right approach post naive. But I think it was a fairly common assumption. Uh, I think so. And I think that's probably what's reflected okay, in that. I'm language. sorry, again, it's probably not relevant for the point you're particularly wanting to make here, but it just brought me up short reading it. Let me read on. This is part of a general trend in the authorities which deprecates the drawing of uh, or the identification of different categories of case and treating them differently and applying different thresholds or tests in relation to them. Uh, again, it's not the precise difference between this case and, and earlier cases, but what it shows is that it, it, it's not permissible 
to change the either the underlying pr principles or the threshold for establishing indirect discrimination simply because you're faced with a different, arguably different type of case. The, the threshold and the underlying principles have to remain the same. And what all of the cases we've just been through demonstrate, as well as the, the earlier provisions in, and their specific terms, is that right from the outset, indirect discrimination was not about analysing the size or value of the difference. It was about analysing the extent to which it is more likely to be women than men who experience that less favourable treatment. And to come back to the, the interpretation question that arises in relation to 69 in this case. If the respondent, the ET and the EAT, were right in this case that as a matter of statutory construction you have to analyse the whole term where you have a term that has some value to it. You can't leave out of account in their, on their analysis the value of the actual pay difference. Then that would have the effect, must logically have the effect, of reversing the Seymour Smith and Barry approach, even in the old binary cases, because you'd have to apply the interpretation equally to both types of case. So on the approach of the respondents and the, the lower tribunals in this case, um, we give an example of this in our skeleton argument, and I've not written down which paragraph it is. Let me just... Um, if you had an employer with a single pay point progression, so you start with X and after five years you go to X plus a thousand, then if the ET and the EAT are right, you can no longer analyse the, the disparate impact or the particular disadvantage in that respect by looking at the proportions of men and women in the advantaged and disadvantaged groups. You would have to analyse it by looking at the total average pay of men and the total average pay of women. Paragraph 34 of our skeleton, where we, we give that uh, example. And digging a little deeper into the example begins to illustrate the problem with the average pay approach. Because the result will then depend on what is the value of the minimum. Because if the, the minimum is... £20,000, then depending on the, the, the extent to which there is a uh, disparate impact, the percentage difference could be up to 5%. It won't, be, it won't get all the way there unless there's direct discrimination going on, probably. It's not the value of the minimum as such, it's the proportionate size yeah. of the uh, minimum element and the variable level. Yes, exactly right. Yeah. So if the, if the variable element is fixed at 1,000 and the minimum is 20,000, then the differential could be up to 5%. So over a period of time, it may be on the, the 3 to 5% threshold that the, the respondent, I think, accepts on their approach would succeed. But if the minimum is 100,000, then the differential is never going to be bigger than 1%. And on the respondent's approach, the, the claim would fail. Well, the ratio 
ratios doesn't fall into, into that trap. So this application of the approach of the ET and the EAT to the, the conventional binary division case shows you both it can't be right because it would have the effect of reversing previous authority in relation to those cases. And secondly, it can't be right because it produces different results uh, based on something that is irrelevant, namely the proportionate size of the variable bit compared with the non-variable bit. The, that's the, the first strand in support of my central contention in relation to the authorities. The second strand I can take much, much quicker because it's one case. Uh, I'm going to call it Chez because I can't pronounce the rest of it at tab 22. I think Chez is right. I did have a case where someone thought it was the name of a restaurant. And that's <laughs> Chez, but it isn't. The facts are far removed from our case. Uh, this concerned uh, a shop owner in a district in Bulgaria which had a predominantly Roma population and uh, there had been numerous instances of damage and unlawful connections to electricity meters which resulted in the authorities putting them up high so this shop owner couldn't check her meter and uh, and it caused her problems because she couldn't see whether her bills were right or monitor her usage. And the quest one of the questions that the court had to consider was whether or not that uh, was uh, arguably an instance of indirect discrimination. The court first actually addressed direct discrimination, which we need to concern ourselves with, but uh, went on in case it was wrong in its conclusion that it probably was direct discrimination to consider indirect discrimination. Beginning at page 45 of the uh, report, paragraph 92, the court identifies the... Couldn't just uh, over lunch or overnight, someone just goes to the IRR person of the report, because yes. I think that's simply that's his judgment. Um, at paragraph 92, by its uh, sixth to ninth questions, uh, which it's appropriate to take together, the referring court raises in essence the issue of the meaning of the terms apparently neutral practice and uh, put persons of a racial or ethnic origin at a particular disadvantage compared with other persons. And then could I ask you to read paragraphs 96 to 103 and then 109. Gives the, 100 gives the answer. 
remember the just make sure I asked you, was the claimant to Roma herself? No. Yeah. So Chez says in terms that particular disadvantage is not concerned with the seriousness of the disadvantage doesn't mean particularly serious disadvantage. It means that it is particularly persons with the relevant prote protected characteristic who are affected by the disadvantage. So all, all of that, that has been a long way of developing the first of my essential propositions, which is that what it is that has to be measured is the likelihood of it being a, uh, being a woman who experiences lower pay than a man, whether it is particularly women who experience lower pay. And what expressly has not to be measured <coughs> is whether the lower pay that they receive is particularly significant in terms of its value, either in absolute terms or relative to the overall pay. That's the underlying principle. And then in analysing how you test that, the court, the tribunal, is then constrained by the dictates of logic to adopt an approach which tests that issue. And I, I needn't spend a long time developing the, the constraints of logic point. In, in fact, unless you want me to, I won't turn up the authority at all. But uh, in Grundy, in British Airways PLC, which you have at TAB, uh, 17 of the authorities bundle uh, paragraphs, um, 26 through to 31, not just as it makes that point. Can I just be, make sure I've understood this? I'm not sure, it, I think it's a different point from my Lord, so it may sound similar, or maybe it is the same point. Anyway, um, average can still be perfectly legitimate if it is a proxy for, or a way of arriving at, frequency, which in many types of cases it will be. Yes. But not here. Yes. The, uh, the way in which it could be a proxy for that here, if it's going to be relied on at all, is, the, is if you just take the average within the variable bit above the minimum. And I'll take you to some figures which, which show you that. Um, it, there, there was a, a bit of a scrap between us below as to whether or not I was entitled to advance those figures. But I think, think it's accepted that I can advance those, I certainly can advance those figures to attack the use of a total average pay approach because I did make that point to the judge. I think it's argued that I didn't sufficiently make the point to the judge <coughs> in the first instance that if you're going to rely on averages at all, then that would be what you had to do as a sort of alternative. But it's not <coughs> the principal case. And I've understood correctly if I'm wrong. The expert that you relied upon She didn't. What, what happened was uh, I said to the judge um, something to the effect, you can see the problem with averages because if you take out the bit below the minimum, the, the difference jumps from 2% to 20% or something like that. Um, and, uh, and then I said, so if you're going to use it, that's what you'd have to do, but I don't rely on averages. So that's broadly where we were left at the, the, the end of the submission. So I do accept that you could rely on average within variable pay 
as a proxy for distribution, but I'm not trying to say uh, unless I really, really have to, and you have to then uh, decide whether I'm allowed to or not. Uh, I'm not trying to say that that's my primary case in uh, before your lordships. <coughs> What I do rely on that analysis for, however, is the point that I put squarely to the judge, which is that it's a, it's a way of showing what's wrong with relying on total average power. And perhaps just before the, uh, the lunch adjournment, I can finish uh, at, at this point by taking you to paragraph 34 of our skeleton argument in the bundle at page 15. That was about the paragraph you asked, you took us to before, or no, you didn't take us to, but referred us to before. Uh, I, I think it's a different one from the oh, one so. I, yeah. I wrote down paragraph 34, but it, oh, well, it might be that I came to the wrong paragraph. Paragraph 34 is page 11, not, not page 15. I think it's 15 oh, okay. internally, but 11 in the bundle. Yeah. Right. Um, I haven't so far been looking at your skirt in my listing, so it's just... It's, I've taken mine out anyway. <coughs> yes, 34 has the figure. That must have been what you were referring to before. It, it wasn't Scott, what I was Scott. referring to before because I was taking a different example before. But oh. um, I, I, I think forty-five maybe what I was referring to before. Oh right. No, but let's just check. Do you want to check that just so we get our notes right? I think you're right. Looking at it. Yeah, forty-five is what I was referring to before, and thirty-four is what I now want to refer to. Okay. purpose of illustrating that the two methodologies that were advanced in this case I don't simply represent a, a, a choice between alternative methods of testing something where it was all a matter for the judge as part of his fact-finding responsibility to address them uh, and decide which to accept. They, they carry with them inherent logical consequences that mean they are testing different things and therefore a choice between them constitutes a choice in principle about what it is you're measuring. Yeah. <coughs> and the, the hypothetical examples that illustrate this point at paragraph 34 are based on two hypothetical situations where exactly the same district rule is used to determine at which point on a four-point pay scale everybody sits. And in both cases, the distribution is the same. You have 10% of men at the bottom, 15% at the first point, 25 at the third, and 50% at the top and the distribution is diametrically then reversed for women. Uh, and the only difference in the two cases is that in case one, the range is 100,000, sorry, the range is 1,000 and the minimum is 100,000, whereas in case two, the range is 10,000 and the minimum is 50,000. So my Lord's point exactly that what is really important, as we'll see, is the ratio of the variable bit to the non-variable bit. Uh, and <coughs> if you look at case one with the short range on top of a big minimum pay, you'll see that that distribution produces a percentage difference in average total pay of 0.43%, so on the claimants and the lower tribunals approach, fails. But, to take my Lord's point about average in relation to variable pay sometimes being a proxy, uh, 
the percentage difference in average variable pay <coughs> is just over 60%. Then in case two, which has the shorter, the longer pay scale with the lower minimum, the difference in average total pay jumps to 7.58% on the same distribution with the same rule applying. Um, and so on the VAT and the respondent's case, in ET's case, succeeds. But the average variable pay comparison remains the same. And I think, although I ha don't have the algebraic competence to prove it as a mathematical certainty, I think I'm probably right in saying that it will, if you have the same distribution and you simply vary those ratios, the average variable pay as a percentage difference will always be the same, but varying the ratio will dramatically affect the average total pay. So it may well be that average variable pay is a, is a reliable proxy for distribution in these cases, uh, but what this shows you is that average total pay is not, unless what you think you're measuring is the actual difference in pay, or the average actual difference in pay. And that's the point we make in the following paragraph, because both sides, as it were, uh, of the argument in this case, point to these sorts of statistics and say, look, this shows the distorting effect of the other side's argument. And what that tells you is that actually we're using the word distortion as a proxy for the different underlying <coughs> premises as to what it is you're measuring. If you start, as in my submissions, the AT and the respondents do, with the proposition that you have to measure differences in, in actual pay in some way as part of the analysis under section 69.2, then it does become surprising that a hundred pound difference in pay is is a different produces a different answer on a distribution approach, depending on the the size of the range and its relationship with the the minimum. So, but but what that reflects is the underlying presumption. And so, when we say, as we do, that it's distorting to rely on total average, what we actually mean is. By relying on total average pay, you're starting from the wrong premise that what you should be measuring is, uh, is the actual amounts of pay. My Lord, it's just after one o'clock. I wonder if that would be a convenient Yes. Um, looking at your uh, roadmap, you're almost at your destination, aren't you? Um, which slightly surprised me because, um, I mean, uh, uh, but we, what we haven't done at all but I assume you'll say it will fall into place if you've got this bit right, is look at the reasoning below. Yes. That will take a bit of time. That will take a bit of time. But what, when do you expect to finish? I would expect to finish by around about three. Yes, well, that's, that's not problematic. Um, uh, thank you very much. Well, I think since you're so reliable, we will give ourselves a full hour and say we'll come back at some uh, five past two. And you can have till five past three.